It is the year 2020. Unitarian Universalists have come a long way since William Ellery Channing was preaching his messages of divine love. I admit that when I first came into Channing's writings, I found his words antiquated and hard to read. Truth be told, my affection for William Ellery Channing started not through his writing, but through a larger-than-life statue of Channing that is prominently on display at the edge of the Boston Public Garden. It faces Arlington Street Church, where Channing himself served as minister from 1803 to 1842. And what moved me about first seeing that statue was that on that particular day, Boston was in the midst of its annual LGBT Pride Parade which goes right by Arlington Street Church. And I loved seeing William Ellery Channing with his big formal pulpit robe and his Bible in hand, ready to preach about how God loves every one of us. And for that special day, he was proudly wearing a bright rainbow feather boa and holding a rainbow flag and I was like, yes, that is one of the religious founders of my faith home. He stands there on the edge of that public garden, in some ways utterly unchanging and rigid, but also promoting his faith still to all who walk by. This faith that says that God loves everyone so enormously that if you were really to take that in, it would be like waking up to a whole new world. Everything we know would be experienced differently than it was before. Utter transformation. We would feel so seen and heard and loved and trusted, he says. We would have strength for every challenge in this life. Endless supplies of hope and energy and joy. Oh, so much joy. We would, in short, fall in love with the world all over again. If only we could fathom the love that God has for us. But that's the theist interpretation. And not all of us are theists. Or perhaps we aren't theists in the way that Channing was, or in the way that Channing's congregation was. So is there another way then to imagine the truth of this idea that God loves us all in such a transformational way that if we truly understood it, our lives would be forever different? Of course, the answer is yes. We don't have doctrine or dogma here in our Unitarian Universalist faith. I'm not going to tell you whether to believe in God or spirit or any other higher power or source of being. But I am going to invite you into covenant with me and others in our faith. And as part of that covenant, part of those promises that we make with one another, is that promise to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That's our first promise that we make as Unitarian Universalists, to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And sometimes when I say that sentence, I add two words onto the end for clarity. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, even you. Because some of you got imprinted with beliefs that make you think that somehow you're exempt from that promise, that promise of love just as some people somehow believe that God doesn't love them. And I like to be sure that everyone understands that no one is exempt. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and that includes you, and that includes me, and that includes others, whether or not it is popular, or whether or not they themselves have found their own worth and dignity which is exactly what Channing says God does, affirms and promotes the inherent worth and dignity of every person, even though God knows so many people. 
Even still, God loves them all and wishes to care for them and honor them and make sure they have a voice. And so should we. And the other promises we make as Unitarian Universalists just kind of emerge from that promise. We promise to promote justice and equity, make sure everyone has a voice, a vote in what matters to us, make sure that we work for peace. We have these shared promises, but we are people who have a diversity of personal beliefs. You can follow Jesus or Buddha or Allah, and or you can practice indigenous traditions, humanism. We each get a bag, our belief bag, and we get to decide which beliefs we're going to put in our bag. And we could take out God entirely, or we could rename God, maybe pick up some more gods along the way, gods of other traditions, or entities that are more like spirits or ancestors. We could add to our belief bag our values, ethics, the guideposts that help us live our lives with meaning and with integrity. But the truth is, some of us, when we get to a certain place in our lives, we just kind of dump everything out of our belief bag, claiming to only believe in what we can see and observe and prove. And we think that our bag is empty at that point, that we don't believe in anything. But the truth is, when we're not paying attention, things start to kind of accumulate in there, kind of like that kitchen drawer. You know, the one with the scissors and the rubber bands and the loose toothpicks and the assorted batteries that may or may not work. You know, who even knows what's in that belief bag after a while? Maybe that, maybe there are beliefs in there that are, are starting to get in your way even. Maybe you start to believe that people are inherently evil or self-serving or that you'll never get ahead or that no one likes you. Maybe you start to believe that no one else is worth liking. Maybe you start to believe that if you stay busy enough, you won't have to face your driving sense of inadequacy. Or that if you stay far enough away from people, they won't hurt you. Or that it, maybe you start to believe that you're only valuable if you're constantly helping others. Or that certain people who dress a certain way are more or less valuable than other people. You could start to see how that belief bag could get really heavy if you don't tend to what is going in there. And most of us probably have some beliefs that have snuck into our belief bag when we weren't looking. And I think this time, this pandemic, is a good time to help us take inventory of what it is we believe. Because this, right now, is when you really can confront those beliefs, when things are shifting, when things aren't how they've always been, or when people are going through hardship and loss or loneliness. This time when long-held assumptions are getting challenged, which is happening for a lot of people, including me. Catherine Williamson, our Director of Religious Exploration, and I have been talking a lot about our plans for the fall and for next year here at the church. And we keep trying to plan things, but we have no idea what the fall is even going to look like. And I start to worry, too. I worry about those of you who are financially insecure, or those of you who have jobs that are exposing you to COVID-19 on a regular basis. I worry about you. And I want to know that when it's going, when this all ends, that I want to know that it's going to be all better. But I also know that sometimes there is no all better. And I also know that people are wearing thin right now. I've heard stories from friends who are sheltering in place with children or spouses where relationships maybe weren't so strong to begin with. And with all this time together, and with all this stress that people are under, and no one going off to work or school. There's a lot of hardship there. And then just the sheer injustice and pain about how this virus is impacting lower income people and people of color disproportionately. 
and the sheer injustice and pain about how some jobs provide for this kind of thing and some don't. In these moments, what we need, perhaps more than ever, is to be able to reach into that bag of beliefs and find something that draws us back to what Channing called the constant consciousness of divine fellowship. And I've been wondering, you know, for Channing, it's about God, God's love. But what is that belief for me? If not this sense of being in constant consciousness of divine fellowship, what is it that I believe that helps draw me back into something good and redemptive? And I have one, one belief in my bag that I go to, and that gets me through the hardest times in my life. One belief, not so much in a god or gods or spirit, not so much in principles or values, one belief, and that is simply that our world is worth falling in love with over and over again. And I am willing to risk heartache in order to love the world again. That's it. I believe that our world is worth loving, no matter what. And let me be honest, sometimes when I reach into my bag, I cannot find that particular belief. Even though I really want to. When I was going through divorce some years ago, I couldn't find that belief for a while. And recently during the sheltering at home and all that's going with it, I have moments when I've stopped believing in the world not just the people in it, although that's part of it, but also just all of it. What are we doing? I forget to fall in love with the world because, because why? There's so much pain. But thankfully, I get these beautiful moments, including one of you, a First Unitarian member whose mother just died last week from COVID-19. And she's so grateful for her mother's life right now. And she talks about the simultaneous joy of having her mother in this life, and also the simultaneous sadness at this idea of moving through the world without her mother in it. And she reminds me that even in these most tender times, the world is still worth falling in love with again. That massive change in our lives, like living without one's parent in the world for the first time ever, is something we are meant to face with all of the emotions and also with a sense of wonder and possibility and perhaps just some simple belief encapsulated in one word, that word, yes. Yes, I will keep going on. Yes, I will find joy again. Yes, this life is worth living. This world is worth loving. Yes, I will fight for justice. Yes, I will believe that good is possible. And I think of that video we watched of Carter performing, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? On the posting of this video, Carter wrote, quarantine made playing music with a conventional band impossible, so I decided to try something new. What is it that gives a person, a musician, the strength to face isolation having no collaborative music partners around, and to face that challenge by creating a band all alone with no other musicians. And in the last couple of weeks, when I cannot get to my yes, which is more often than I'd like to admit, I watched this video of Carter getting to his yes. 
Despite the losses of living out his senior year of high school at home and all the loss that goes with that, graduation and prom and all of that, not seeing his friends, he still gets there. He still gets to that yes. There's an African-American spiritual that says, over my head I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. Whether or not you believe that a better world is waiting, whether or not you believe there must be a God somewhere, whether or not you believe there is a yes somewhere, no matter what words you use, May you find in that bag of beliefs something that helps draw you back to your strength, back to your joy and hope, and that ultimately helps you help others back to their strength and joy and hope.